Story time. Let's see if any of my fellow musician folk find this one familiar. It's late 2011, and after a long session of teabagging your friends in a match of Modern Warfare and telling your cousin Roman that you can't go bowling, you hop on YouTube and find a one-hour mix of something called Chill Step to vibe out to while you design your masterpiece in Line Writer. There's the intricate weaving of blossoming synth lines from this black mill person around the searingly beautiful vocals of Vila. Ramsey's B takes you to another world with these immense bass lines and grooving organic percussion. Mode Step brings you into such a state of enchantment that it seems to subtly haunt you for weeks to come, and a Florence and the Machine remix elevates a song you barely acknowledged into something that forms your musical tastes and identity for years to come. One day, you decide to try your hand at making a little something for yourself. You spend the subsequent years perfecting your craft, learning everything you can to establish yourself as one of the peers of your once favorite artists, and one day, it all comes together. You've selected the perfect samples. The loops meld together beautifully. You've artfully selected the presets to perfectly complement not just the mix, but the fundamental emotion of the song. Your melodies are heart-wrenching. Your chords twist and turn your ear. You've put every last bit of polish and refinement you conceivably can into your work, and you've transcended from something that was a track you made into a work of art. Now, it's your time to shine. You look to your Spotify playlists and your favorite YouTube mix channels to find out how to get featured for yourself. And something about SubmitHub seems to come up a lot. A short Google trip later, you create an account and you're met with some free credits. Right on. But if you really want to get heard, of course, you have to get some premium credits to skip the line. You pause for a moment. After all, $50 is a lot to ask from an independent artist just trying to get their name out there. But this is your career, and that's an investment worth making because, let's be real, I mean, the music's gonna speak for itself. You make your pitch, you write an individualized letter to each and every curator, and you wait. And one day, you're finally met with a response from one of your favorite curators. Hey, thanks so much for sending the track over, they say. The production is so clean, and these sounds are almost unlike anything I've featured before. This is really something. Your eyes brim with a glimmer of hope. I love how you've put together the best of all worlds here, and this really might be one of the best tracks I've heard in the last couple months. That once cornered ember of pride within you now radiates with such enormous intensity that you feel a rush on the surface of your skin. Is this how it all comes together? Is this the start of your career as a musician? Could this really be that moment that becomes your origin story? You read on through that final line to bring it home. But the kick drum at 2 minutes and 34 seconds really takes me out of it, so I'm gonna have to pass on this one. Sorry. Better luck next time. Smiley face. That prideful glow turns into a fit of rage that now sets a brick in your stomach, and the final question remains. What the fuck is that? Today's video is brought to you by me. I make some pretty affordable instruments for Decent Sampler, which is free. I think they're pretty neat and you might like them too. I also have a patron program you can join to get access to exclusive courses, presets, samples, and other stuff. Go me. Submit Hub, more lovingly known as Reject Hub, or maybe even as Pay money to have someone take a fat dump all over your music for no reason in particular hub is one spicy tato in the music sphere, and it's often credited for being a scam, a ripoff, some kind of payola scheme, or just another way to extract money from already struggling independent artists. Now, I know that this story at first might seem like something that's a little bit niche and something that doesn't really affect you, but I promise you that Submit Hub and platforms like it have such a profound effect on the music economy for both artists and audiences that this is pretty important and I think it's interesting. But before we really get into the meat of everything here, let's take a quick sidebar to examine the definition of the word scam because it's one of the things that seems to be most often misleadingly associated with the idea of what SubmitHub is. 
A scam is defined as a fraudulent or deceptive act or operation to deceive and defraud presumably someone or to obtain presumably something such as money in a dishonest and often illegal way. But that's not really what SubmitHub is doing, is it? So if SubmitHub is not a scam, what is it? And why does it feel like such bullshit? How does it affect artists? Why should audiences and consumers care? And how is a lot of this related to airplanes being shot down in the 1940s? Well, buckle in, because this is going to be a little bit of a deep dive, and it's a pretty bumpy ride all the way down. In 2005, Anthony Volokhin, a sophomore computer science major at Hunter College, was growing frustrated with music magazines and the radio. He soon found, through the magic of the internet, blogs like Stereo Gum and Music for Robots, and he was fascinated to learn that people were so dedicated to the art of listening, appreciating, reviewing, and just generally curating music online. And shortly thereafter, Hype Machine was born. Hype Machine has been an extremely important player in the backbone of the musical internet ever since, acting as sort of the go-to database of what the buzz is in music online. With hundreds of blogs feeding into its stream of stuff, Hype Machine curates the top players into a feed where listeners, reviewers, and artists alike can then discover new and popular music from all players of the music industry, from first-time releases from obscure indie artists to the latest AAA pop hit from the chart-dominating starlet of the day. Since its launch, it's been featured in CNN, Wired, and was even mentioned on The Guardian's Top 100 websites of 2009, cementing its place as a staple among music enthusiasts and critics. With the dawn of this new era of internet accessibility and the ability for unknown reviewers to become legitimized seemingly overnight by starting their own platform and artists to be discovered through them thanks to their often voracious readers, there was, albeit briefly, a big boom of this new paradigm of blog blogs and reviewers that offered a legitimate but subversive alternative to the mainstream. As becoming a curator or reviewer became more of a financially viable career online, there was a massive boom of new websites, forums, and playlists thriving on the newfound frontier of the internet. Eventually though, as with most things online, this became a bloated and crowded mess, and the market and noise floor rose to ever higher levels, making it harder and harder to break into the reviewer space and also for artists to get their music heard. This isn't even beginning to touch on the explosion of home recording technology at the time that gave rise to so much music and so much garbage music, and this sort of weird, collective, forced adaptation of a celebration of mediocrity, but that's a whole different story for a whole different time. Hype Machine's legacy was a huge factor for the creation of a new era of curation and submission, and in 2015, SubmitHub was born. Music blogger Jason Grishkoff, who notably also is president and founder of Indie Shuffle, created SubmitHub as a service designed to be a platform where musicians and tastemakers can intersect with a core mission to, quote, efficiently and transparently connect artists with curators. With an estimated half million visitors every single month, I think it's fair to say that SubmitHub is one of the most popular and contentious pitching platforms in the broader music sphere. As a private company with a small staff and a founder who staunchly defends its merits and is open to admitting its flaws on social media and internet forums, SubmitHub has arguably risen to the top of the collective consciousness of both musicians and curators alike, and is something that has a profound effect on the consumable landscape of music for listeners, with its influence ranging from massive Spotify playlists to the most popular curation channels on YouTube, to top name blogs and reviewers, and even more recently, to social media influencers. With the current state of music, the insane affordability and accessibility of home recording technology, and the absolutely unbelievable bum rush to be the next artist to break, comes the problem of simply too much garbage being out there. So, what is an aspiring curator to do? In an interview with Lander, Jason Grishkoff notes that after a few years of running Indie Shuffle, the submissions became incredibly overwhelming, to the point where he was receiving literally hundreds of emails per day. Because of this ridiculous influx of promotion requests, 
He set up a fake submissions address to weed out the general junk, and overall grew somewhat jaded with the fact that artists didn't really want to build a relationship. They instead simply wanted their feature on Indie Shuffle so they could take their next step on the path to stardom. Given Indie Shuffle was not really a viable business at the time, SubmitHub came about as a way to make ends meet for Jason and also solve the problem that so many music curators and critics were likely facing. So, for a moment, let's take a quick journey through the mind of the modern music curator and see if we can't spot the problem that makes services like SubmitHub feel like such a ripoff. As a young adult, you branched out your musical wings and soared through countless records and genres and artists. You developed a refined musical palette that others would be envious of, and it made you the first one to ask when someone was looking for something new. And your unique ability to discern the legitimate from the general junk made you the overlord of the Friday Night Party playlist. As your discerning tastes grew, you decided to start your own playlists, and maybe even a review blog. Your friends always come to you for a second opinion or a fresh hit of new musical innovation, and your musician friends respect you with utmost authority. And, of course, your Uber driver always passes you the aux cord. Your blog, realistically, doesn't make much, if any, money, but you're actually starting to get some serious traction with a few of your Spotify playlists and your mix channel on YouTube. Before you know it, you've got half a dozen playlists with a couple thousand followers each, and your YouTube channel has absolutely ballooned into one of the channels to check out for the next incredible mix. Along with your newfound success, you find yourself receiving thousands of unsolicited messages, cringy self-promo DMs, and carrier pigeons, sometimes per day, from artists all around the globe desperate for senpai to notice them. A lot of this, as one might expect, is just garbage music that was written by, I don't know, someone whose aunt one time told them they had a great voice, so they went on to start a band and ended up headlining at their local small town harvest festival, and no one really had the gall or wherewithal to tell them that they just kind of sound like Joan Jett choking down a meat grinder, but I mean, hey, that's neither here nor there. Running a playlist, no matter how popular, really isn't going to bring you in any money because you, as the curator, didn't write those songs that you're gaining all these streams for for these burgeoning independent artists and maybe their associated labels. And your YouTube mix channel is more or less the same story. Because you are hosting their copyrighted works, you don't get really any cut of the ads that YouTube is now forcing onto your videos. So what's a curator to do? In this video, revealing how to make money on Spotify and how Today complete beginners are earning an extra $100 a day exactly just by listening to music that you know As a playlist creator or a music reviewer, your options are, generally speaking, pretty limited. You might get selected by the Spotify gods one day to become one of the official playlist curators. That might be a dream job, but let's be honest, the chances of that happening are exceedingly unlikely, so your best option is probably to look elsewhere. You might deal with sponsors or something like that to create playlists. You might come up with a sort of clever advertising scheme on your website with Google ad embeds and things like that. Or maybe you start an email list cataloging your favorite new releases and so on and use affiliate links in those emails to generate an income. But most of the time, this ends up being kind of small potatoes as a side income and isn't something that can really sustain a career. But what if there was a service out there that could not only organize the insane amount of submissions you're getting into your inbox, but also paid you for your time to listen to them? Now we're talking. Like becoming a music artist, getting your feet into the door as a curator really isn't easy. SubmitHub requires a minimum of 1,000 real followers. You'll also need to regularly listen to music submissions for a set amount of time per song, provide some level of feedback to the artist as to why it was or was not chosen to be featured in some cases, and manage your account to ensure that it's both active and of high quality to rise to the top of the feed for artists to submit to. If you think your inbox was busy before, just wait until you become a regularly recommended curator. Playlist Push, on the other hand, requires 400 real followers. But you need to generate at least 30 new listeners per month, and at least 1% of those followers must actively be listening to your playlists. You'll be sent songs daily, and you'll need to review them within 14 days in written English. 
Whether you accept or reject the song, you'll need to provide a short explanation, and if a song is accepted, you'll need to add it to your playlists in order to gain points. Of course, the more points you gain, the more money you'll earn. Daily Playlister, a maybe somewhat lesser-known alternative that has perhaps the most stringent conditions of all, requires 1,000 followers and at least 200 active listeners. You'll have a page where you'll need to report the data about the songs in your playlist, provide a rating for each song, create a written review in English or Spanish, and decide if you want to add the song to your playlists or not. In the event that you do feature the song, the artist will in turn promote your playlist on their social media, and you'll get paid. There are a lot of other services like these out there, things like MySphera, MusoSoup, SoundPlate, Repost Exchange, and even Spotify's own Spotify for Artists playlist pitching tool. But they all more or less follow a similar structure and requirements list in order to be selected as one of the curators. Now, the pay here varies pretty significantly. Playlist Push offers certain qualified curators up to $15 per individual song review. But others, like SubmitHub, offer just 50 cents per song review as long as it's done within the required time limit. So, yeah. Yeesh. Let's now have a look at the ugly numbers. This means if you realistically want to make a living at a pretty respectable average of $50,000 a year, at the lowest and most accessible end of this pay scale, we're talking about having to listen to somewhere around 100,000 songs every single year. If we assume each song is around three and a half minutes, we're talking about spending 243 days per year spent listening to music nonstop. Assuming that you also like sleeping, having a social life, eating, and not constantly having your ears assaulted by whatever god-awful lo-fi hip-hop pirate metal fusion polka that Jamie from Keokuk, Iowa has concocted, this really doesn't sound like a great deal. It's now a numbers game if you want to eat and pay bills, and so rises quantity over quality. Not really out of some kind of malicious intent, but out of pure necessity. And along with that comes a tendency to have to favor things that naturally do well and are popular, and not necessarily things that truly appeal to you as a curator. If you don't want to maintain your playlists and play the game, there are a thousand other struggling curators out there who will absolutely be the first to take your seat at that table. And that brings us to the million dollar question. Why does SubmitHub feel like such a fucking ripoff? I think it's easy to take the armchair theorist route here and say that SubmitHub is really just utilizing the same grift as something like Unison Audio or Cymatics or Guitar Center or Moog or Ibanez or Gibson or pretty much any other company in the music industry designed to make a profit by extracting money from musicians. It's just that age-old model of, in a gold rush, sell shovels. Everyone wants to be a star. And if you offer them a way to make that happen, especially one that's purported to be this secret hack that the pros don't want you to know, often for a crazy one-time only price, they're absolutely going to be a lot more willing to part with their money in order to make that happen because you're simply playing off their emotions and they're too emotionally worked up to just realize that. But what happens when that illusion gets shattered? What happens when we take that shortcut and we find out that it's really not all it was cracked up to be. This brings about our good old friend, negativity bias. In almost all cases, our response to negative events is significantly more potent than our response to positive events, even if, by all accounts, the two are of equal intensity or subjective value. This becomes even more significantly pronounced when we attribute these negative events to external agency. When we're able to place the blame on some external factor or individual, in this case SubmitHub or the curator in question, we're able to then vindicate ourselves of any possible sense of fault. It's maybe worth noting here that this really means that SubmitHub is definitively not a payola scheme, although you do have to buy credits in order to pitch to curators and playlisters and all that sort of stuff. The act of submitting and paying for these credits doesn't guarantee any kind of placement, which results in a pretty ugly ego blow. When we as artists work so hard in our music and we submit it to find that we're constantly rejected, we immediately feel a sense of being conspired against. 
Hearing that our song isn't at the right tempo, the mix is too kick-heavy, that there are too many or not enough chords, that the vocal line doesn't focus enough on mustard, and other such minute critiques lead us to believe that we're simply acting as an easy target and just throwing our money away into a void. It's noted that on Submit Hub, the average acceptance rate is somewhere about 20%. So even if we as an artist are releasing music that is the absolute top tier quality, the most we can reasonably expect on a campaign is about a 20% acceptance rate. And even then, anything remotely approaching 20% would be considered a resounding success by any stretch of the imagination. However, after getting faced with so many rejections, it's easy to find that sense of external agency to cast the blame on instead of having to take that uncomfortable and unfortunate unbiased and critical look at our own work and its merit to be placed on those playlists or featured in that review. But as soon as we get one major success, all that washes away and it is absolved of any wrongdoing and we're happy campers again. And it just kind of flips that whole negativity bias thing on its head. So let's talk about airplanes. In World War II, the Center for Naval Analyses conducted a damage study on aircraft after their return from various missions. After observing certain patterns of damage, the clear conclusion became to add more armor to the areas that received the most damage in order to further minimize the loss of aircraft in combat situations. But Abraham Wald looked at this and said, nah. Wald, a Hungarian mathematician, was renowned for his ability to apply the principles of mathematics and statistics to wartime issues. Wald was able to see through this initial data set to understand that the entire study was contingent on observing the aircraft that had successfully returned from a mission, even though they had sustained damage. This was an incomplete picture, as there was no data available on the aircraft that did not return. Because the aircraft that had returned home had damage in certain areas, this meant that the damage in those areas was able to be considered survivable, and no extra reinforcement was truly necessary. This meant that the real problem was not the areas that had been hit, but the areas that had not been hit, since the aircraft that sustained damage in these critical areas would result in the failure of the aircraft. This phenomenon is known as survivorship bias, and it is a nasty little bastard, and I think that this is a large part of what makes services like SubmitHub feel like such a fucking ripoff to artists. Because the most desirable and therefore competitive playlists have so few slots and there's so much music out there being made that wants to be put on them, curators have the unfortunate job of having to pick and choose the right things that warrant being placed on that playlist, and therefore, the most discerning nuances and minute details simply have to be considered, because that's the game that they're stuck playing. When musicians hear about services like SubmitHub that naturally want to flaunt their ability to place artists onto popular playlists and in front of important curators to break even the most indie of indie artists, they're built up with a sense of expectation that these positive outcomes are to be assumed. Sure, there might be the occasional rejection, but it's services like these that independent artists depend on to make their way into their sliver of the spotlight. With all that in mind, it is extraordinarily easy and convenient to overlook nearly all of the other songs and artists that didn't get featured in these playlists. This of course gives us that incomplete data set, and we end up developing a really false understanding of the reality of the process. With this skewed perception, you can also develop a sort of conspiratorial mindset in that you think there's this specific talent or effort or methodology that needs to take place, and this is only inflated by all the countless resources out there pretending to offer you some kind of insight into how to enhance or hack these attributes to improve your chances of getting playlisted, once again for probably a convenient one-time crazy low price deal special made just for you, and it's all pretty nice because it fails to address nearly all of the other factors, like timing or networking or random chance or countless other things that come into a playlist curator's decision-making process. This is also pretty dang convenient when you want to take advantage of someone in an emotional state to make them part with $14.95 for 10 tips on how to get played. This is why it's important to remember to consider the broader picture of submission and curation and understand that it's not solely a game of talent or effort. By remaining impartial and open to learning and considering both successful and unsuccessful campaigns, artists can develop a more comprehensive understanding and approach to independent marketing.
As I talked about in a previous video, the effect that this system of playlisting and featuring has on both artists and consumers is pretty far-reaching and pretty darn profound. It's a lot like the scene in The Devil Wears Prada about the cerulean blue sweater, where Miranda Priestly so lovingly exposes us to the uncomfortable reality of the idea of the illusion of choice and the insane amount of back-end things that happen before something reaches us as the consumer. Because of artists' reliance on platforms like streaming services and curation channels, it becomes a game of creating music that's specifically designed and engineered to be featured on these things and not necessarily the truest version of the creator's intended art. These compromises can often be pretty extremely specific because of all the reasons we've explored previously here, and this is the game that the artists have to play, because the playlist curators have to consider the smallest individual details, which means that the musicians in turn have a pretty strict set of rules of what is and is not allowed in order to be featured on the playlist, let alone the ones that have attained any sort of notability and therefore are beneficial to the artist's career. So what this ultimately means is artists are left to produce music rather than create music. This of course also affects the audience. Instead of hearing lots of new and interesting, innovative music, we're generally more exposed to things that are more easily pigeonholed, and artists are, to a degree, outright encouraged to do so in order to find success in an ever more competitive environment. What this ultimately means is a lot of the times, whatever you're listening to, no matter what genre or style it is, if it's through a service that uses playlists or algorithms, it's very likely that the musicians have to take into consideration what these playlists and algorithms are searching for in order to create something, so the artists are inherently sub to the restrictions of that playlist or medium. As much as it might be an artist's dream to create a new kind of grindcore, furry, polka, K-pop fusion, if they really want to make any money in the streaming world and gain the recognition it takes to create a sustainable career as an artist, it's probably more pragmatic to create lo-fi hip-hop to study to, or smooth R&B for cooking dinner in the summer while drinking rosé to, or some dubstep with ever more brutal drops to cut Call of Duty kill cam montages to. It is not a system of art. It's a machine of content, and it's a fucking brutal climb to the top. You're either willing to accept the sacrifices you have to make, or you can sit down and watch everyone else who's willing to do so step on your face as they climb above you into the limelight. It's not about music, it's about fucking plays. It's about followers, it's about what playlist you featured on and who reviewed your last single. If you're under 10,000 Spotify listeners a month, what kind of fucking clown are you calling yourself a goddamn musician, you fucking idiot? You're not valid until you've made it to the goddamn top. Anything less is fooling yourself and you need to Shut the fuck up and admit it to yourself, you pathetic moron. Pack in your gear, delete your fucking Reddit post, quit promoting your shit on my feed, and go get a real job and leave music to the professionals, you absolute fucking idiot. This paints the whole thing in a pretty unflattering light, and it is a sort of gross underbelly to have to take a look at. It's really uncomfortable to acknowledge that a lot of this stuff is just playing the game on all levels, really, and it's just one big glorified clusterfuck at best. Of course, this goes way beyond just music, though. Your favorite food truck has to have a certain Instagram-friendly aesthetic. Your favorite coffee shop needs to have the right vibe to film that TikTok morning routine clip in. and. YouTube video essays need the right thumbnail and some kind of istification in the title so that some asshole with glasses can act like an expert on something he obviously only researched for 10 minutes because he's just a bitter cynic about his failed music career or something along those lines, just so it can play that game and not be subject to sitting on the sidelines for those that will. But it's not all bad, and I do think there's a way out of it, and I think it's actually pretty easy. David Ogilvy, a renowned advertising tycoon and someone who's often credited as the father of advertising, was a pretty sharp cookie. After his work at the Gallup Audience Research Institute, he developed his systems of thought and meticulous research methods strongly adhering to reality rather than conjecture in the world of advertising. He was also kind of a propaganda machine, but that's 
not really the point I want to make here. David believed that the most effective way to sell and advertise a product is not only to base your advertisement strategies on tone and information known about the consumer, but to treat the consumer as intelligent rather than someone to yell information and specifications at. I think this is largely why the rise of these hyper-specific niche playlists is not only so notable, but so important. Because as the old saying goes, build it and they will come. If we as consumers want artists to create truer and more authentic versions of their art, we have all the tools to make that happen. We can create our own playlists that are super weird and niche and specific. We could start our own reviews and blogs with blackjack and hookers, and we can share our findings on the infinite world of social media. Because somewhere out there, no matter how specific our needs are to be catered to, there's probably an artist willing or desperate to do so. David Ogilvy once said, give me the freedom of a tight brief. When the brief is clear, the creatives know where they're going and can start thinking about it on the way home. By removing both the paralyzing infinity of endless options and the uncomfortable choice of artistic compromise, we're instead free to constrain our focus on the things that actually matter and are achievable. As consumers and reviewers and critics and curators and just general fans of music, we can create the outlets for artists to express themselves, and of course, we in turn benefit from it with tons of new and interesting music. And as artists, we're then freed of the shackles of playing the algorithm and submission game to explore more pure and experimental forms of our own work. I really do believe that these same systems and platforms that have created the problem are themselves the biggest part of the solution. And as much as I hate to sum it up this way because it feels so cheap to say, it all really starts with you. If you simply take the time to start a playlist of whatever it is you like, that act in and of itself might be all it takes to encourage an artist out there to make something that is truly meaningful to them. Even if it is just some wonky D&B to clean your Twilight Sparkle flashlight to after one last damp cigarette outside of a Waffle House, that's totally fine. No matter how niche and weird and specific your tastes might be, someone out there is going to want a piece of that. Rule 34 exists for a reason, after all. Submit Hub, Playlist Push, Daily Playlist, Repost Network, MySphera, MusoSoup, Soundplate, and beyond all exist for a pretty legitimate reason. It's not that they're a scheme to take money from artists. They all just share the same goal of making music more consumable and successful. But of course, it does come at somewhat of a cost. And until consumers choose to address it, or platforms like these implement changes to perhaps better highlight more niche curators or make becoming a micro curator more viable, I suppose we'll just be left to find and submit our music to playlists to rock our walk of shame after a one night stand at Arkansas Rest Stop 84, the usual way. <laughs>